Good morning, everyone. This is Jenny from the schools team at CCSA. And this is the beginning of a series of webinars hosted by CCSA. We have been so inspired by all the innovation happening in the sector over the past couple of weeks and wanted to facilitate leaders sharing with other leaders. We are deeply appreciative of leaders that are willing to share their plans, regardless of where they are in the process. As we say on our website that we hope many of you have seen, uh, there is no perfect answer right now. There are multiple ways to solve this problem and a number of leaders have stepped up to share their plans where they stand and we really appreciate that. We know that a lot of schools are still figuring this out and that is okay. So today we, were, we will hear from Jim Scheibel who is the executive director at Clayton Valley Charter High School in Concord. Uh, Jim has been a very active partner to CCSA and currently serves on CCSA's member council. There will be time for Q&A with Jim towards the end, or if you have a question in the middle, feel free to pop that into the Q&A box. Um, and then if you'd like to speak, uh, raise your hand, and then I can also unmute you if you have follow-up questions after Jim answers your question. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jim. All right, thank you, Jenny. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as you can see, hopefully on your screen, there's a slide deck that I'm gonna walk through. It does say distance learning discussion, and I'm hoping that this is as much of a discussion as possible. Um, we're all in uncharted waters, and so I'm hoping to learn from folks on this call, just as much as I hope that you know when we leave this call, you all have a couple more folks you can lean on and learn from and uh, reach out to for support. Um, I'll make sure that I share with Jenny uh, a couple of Google Docs and other things that you might be able to look at, um, at for more detail following today. It's gonna to be a little bit weird, I think, because I'll be just talking into a screen for a little bit, but I wanna to get to questions uh, as quickly as possible. And I want this to be helpful for you all. Um, and again, we're all going through this together, so by no means is what we're doing at Clayton Valley perfect. Um, it's the best version of what we can do right now, and I know next week will be a better iteration of what we did this week. And so again, we're all just trying to uh, implement that continuous improvement in a much different setting than we thought about three or four weeks ago. Uh, so with that, we'll dive in. Uh, one other piece of context was I know that not everyone on the call has the same level to access of technology. Um, and so we have quite a bit of technology access here at Clayton Valley. And so if there are specific questions about what we're doing with different platforms, um, I wanna be able to get to that at the end, but this, presentation is fairly general um, because all of you are in different circumstances and uh, have different resources at your fingertips for your students. And so again, um, you might find the presentation a little bit general uh, and I wanna be able to get to those questions in that discussion quickly. So we'll dive in. Um, you can see that we've got a couple of uh, agenda items here. Uh, and again, I'm gonna try to go through these as quickly as possible, uh, but not so quickly that I mumble or talk over myself. So let's just jump in with perfect cannot get in the way of progress. Um, so this is just kind of a philosophy piece that I wanted to emphasize. We definitely have had to jump into this right away as everyone else has. Uh, we've seen districts kind of push pause and take time to do professional development or roll out distance learning and our kids aren't stopping. Uh, we have a high school. We have 2,250 kids in our high school. We have 580 seniors who need to graduate and go to college next year. And the colleges or the class the kid will take the, uh, the following year will not necessarily recognize the interruption and in instruction that our kids had. And so we just have to dive right in and make sure that our kids are continuing at, at as best a pace as possible as they were uh, when they were in school. And so this is just, again, a reminder and the thought that um, there's not necessarily a need to have a perfect plan to roll out. Um, and so I just wanna encourage folks to put your best foot forward and uh, approach it with some level of humility. And I think one of the other things we'll talk about here is communication and, and just you know let folks know that, hey, we're doing the best we can. We're all in this together. The feedback we get from everybody, whether it's administrators, teachers, parents, or students is gonna help make the process better. And I'll share a little bit about how we've tried to revise some of our expectations to get some of that consistency. So um, again, don't let perfect get in the way of progress. Um, just dive in and do the best you can. And um, again, put your best foot forward, but have that mindset of we're always gonna get better. So again, not a, not a clear practice there, but uh, hopefully that's just something that's helpful and reassuring that 
Uh, you do not have the perfect plan. We don't have the perfect plan. Nobody has it, but we have kids who are hungry and waiting for something to do and want to be productive. Um, and they desperately want to come back to school, but let's give them the best that we can right now with what we've got. Uh, in terms of communication, um, that's a huge one. And I just want to emphasize that over and over again. Um, you have a lot of different stakeholders. They are looking to you, whether you're a school leader or a teacher or uh, you know, an administrator or whatever it may be. Uh, they want to know what's going on. Again, you're not gonna have all the answers, but please make sure you're communicating. Um, I got a couple of things here in terms of over-communicate, uh, speed versus completeness, uh, and then a couple other ones that we'll go into as well with some examples. So in terms of over-communicate, just some examples here. Uh, we've sent nine family updates since March 9th. What we've started to realize is that uh, the students because we do have high school students and because they do have school emails and a variety of different channels with which they communicate, they need to hear the same thing our parents are hearing. So we're gonna start sending our communications that we send to parents to the student emails as well. Um, we did that starting with our Wednesday update, which was when we shared that we're keeping the school closed until March, I'm sorry, until May 1st uh, per the county health office's recommendation here in Contra Costa County. Um, and we've sent 11 all staff emails uh, or all teacher emails since uh, in about that same time frame since the 13th of March until today. We've got another one teed up to go out today. We do know it's a lot of uh, information going into their inboxes, but we think that over communication is better than the alternative, which is you know not communicating or under communicating. Uh, for myself, and I'm not sure how many folks we have on the call who are reporting to a board, but I, I report to our board of directors. Uh, and I cannot, I don't have the capacity or time to send a separate board update. So I've just been BCCing the board on anything that goes out to all staff or all teachers. Uh, five of my board members are parents. Four of them have seniors. And so they're very interested to know what's going on. And so instead of, you know, sending a separate detailed board update, I just CC, CC them on the email to, uh, to the staff and make sure that they're in the loop with those types of things. And then we have a leadership team on site, an admin team. Um, well, I guess we at the school, they're not necessarily on site, but we've adapted our communication with that team to be every day. And you can see there at the bottom uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we do essentially like a rundown at the end of the day at three o'clock. We keep all of our notes on our running Google Doc for that meeting. And then on Tuesday, uh, that team meets against mostly virtual uh, and we'll talk about teacher and instructional needs. And on Thursday, we'll meet and we'll talk about uh, student and family support. And so we've kind of had those two work streams bucketed out in that we know our teachers need a lot of support so that they're feeding our kids the right thing. And that our students uh, need a lot of support. And so we've tried to kind of bifurcate that process. Uh, the interesting thing is that none of us have, if you're running a high school or a middle school, none of you have extracurricular activities to worry about or sports or student discipline, or some of the daily operations that take up a lot of time. Uh, so all we're doing is focusing on teachers and students, and it's a very interesting time to be able to kind of take advantage of that process, or I'm sorry, of the situation, um, and be able to spend our time really focused on kids and really focused on what our teachers are doing. I think we all know that in the digital world, it's much, easier to see what's going on in the teacher's classroom. And I would just recommend that you take advantage of the time and, and again, just over communicate as much as possible. A couple examples of that in terms of speed versus complete, completeness. This is just a couple lines we have from some of our all staff emails. Um, you know, it says here, we're prioritizing speed over perfect, perfection for some internal communication. Um, this is just kind of a, a starter if you guys need it in terms of language for how you're sh sharing information with families, with your board, with, with staff. Uh, another one would be speaking in these general terms. You can share specifics later. We know that things are on the tip of fo folks' minds, on the tip of your tongue, but you may not have a perfect answer. So you, want, you may want to just say, hey, this is coming uh, and preview it so that folks know it's on its way, know that you've got it together and that you're thinking about the same things they are. Um, but you may not have the full thing baked out yet. And then the last thing, uh, if you need to, it's okay to mention something and then kind of punt it down the road. Uh, this is the case with some of the work we're doing with special education students. We know that school closures were likely announced on Friday the 13th. 
of March. Uh, Gavin Newsom sent an executive order at five o'clock that night. And in his executive order, he said special education guidance is coming out by Tuesday. And we know that came out after 6 p.m. on Tuesday, March 17th. And so it's okay to acknowledge things that, you know, you're thinking about and you're working on, but you know you don't have the answer for because the information is just not yet available. So acknowledge that in your communication and punt it down the road. Uh, in terms of distance learning, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably go a little bit more in depth here, but um, I've just got a couple of, of thoughts on that in terms of simple consistency. Uh, new for you does not mean better and avoid the lowest common denominator. Um, I'm hoping that in the chat and or the, the kind of the live Q&A, if we can unmute some folks when we get through this, um, this is where we spend the most of our time because this is really the meat of what we're trying to do, whether we're talking about teachers or talking about kids. So in terms of simple consistency, um, this is just something that we noticed. Uh, I, I guess it's a real life example for us um, following our first week. Uh, the first week, uh, which was essentially March 16th through the 20th of distance learning, I thought we did an okay job. But then I signed in to our online system as a kid, uh, as an 11th grader on Friday, and I just saw that we had a lot of work to do. Uh, teachers were very eager, kids were very eager, parents were very eager to get work done. But in that eagerness came a lot of inconsistency and a lot of confusion for kids. Um, you'd have teachers posting three or four times a day. You'd have deadlines all over the place. You'd have assignments living in different platforms. Um, it was very hard for me as the executive director to figure out what an 11th grader was supposed to do and when things were supposed to be turned in or due. And so this is again, part of a note that we sent out to folks. In terms of the details, um, you can see here on the left side of the screen, these are essentially the expectations we sent out. Um, we have a platform called Schoology that we've had for quite some time. Some of our teachers use it all the time, even when they're in school uh, in the building, and some of our teachers had never used it before last week. Uh, so this is essentially what we sent out on Friday, March 20th, saying going into the week of March 23rd, every day in Schoology, this is essentially what you need to make sure you have in this section called updates. Schoology essentially ends up like a Facebook page for kids. So if they log into their Schoology account in the morning, we want them to click on updates. Uh, and by 8.30 a.m. see one post for each class that hits these bullet points. There's a calendar feature in Schoology, so you need every assignment posted on that calendar. So a kid can have one place on the calendar where they can see all their assignments and when they're due. Uh, this is not easy with 2,250 kids and 90 something teachers and 160 plus classes that we're offering because if a teacher teaches multiple classes, that's multiple posts that they have to do and we have to make sure as administrators we're, we're checking on that and trying to keep up with it to make sure our teachers are doing what we've asked them to do and being supportive if they can't. Um, but again, from a kid standpoint, we wanna make sure things are simple, clear, and easy for a kid. Uh, some of our teachers, this is, comes naturally to them, and some of them, this is a struggle. We also have teachers who use different platforms like Google Classroom, Edpuzzle, Flipgrid, um, and a couple other ones that I'm learning the names of. And so uh, we wanna make sure, again, that Schoology is the one place where kids, parents, teachers have a, a common anchor or hub. They can find all this basic information. So we did give our teachers um, this email, this an email on Friday, and then the cycle that we did to try to implement it was on Tuesday. We had a virtual meeting with our department chairs, and on Wednesday we had department meetings again virtually, and we did give them an example. So again, it's always good to not only say, hey, here's the expectation, but also here's a good example or exemplar, and that's the best practice with kids, it's the best practice with adults. So again, we gave folks this example, we gave it to them, uh, in a Google Doc so they could just copy and paste and then reformat it for them if they wanted to. But this is essentially what it looks like, uh, condensed down in the format with, in terms of spacing, but this is what it looks like when you post for um, a kid. Uh, the other thing I would just say is, you know, new for you does not mean better. Stick with platforms your kids use when they were in your building every day. Uh, you know, if kids didn't know it when they were in the building, they're not going to learn it from home. Um, we've we've run into that problem. We have some kids, you know, trying very hard because they're very eager and they want to get good grades. They want to do well, uh, really struggling 
not with the content or the assignment, but with just how to actually operate it. How can I get on Flipgrid? How can I do this coding program that I've never heard of before? Um, and also, I mean, uh, teachers should just be focused on the basics. Uh, let them let the teachers get good at something before they try something new with kids. Um, one thing we're talking with our teachers about is if you're trying a new platform with kids, maybe the first couple assignments are just you know basic attendance check-in uh, assignments as opposed to actually a complicated thing that a kid has to complete and submit. So you know on uh, something that's on video, if they check in on the video and they show you they can use all the features, maybe they get full credit for that first assignment. Maybe the second assignment is they do something with a peer on that platform that's really, really easy. Uh, but just again, easing into it, it's very hard for uh, our teachers to learn something new in a virtual space. It's even harder for 30 to 150 of their kids to learn that same new thing in a virtual space. So again, just keep it simple with your distance learning. This is an example here. Uh, you know, a teacher emailed uh, their administrator. You know, I haven't, because we do have an expectation of office hours where teachers are available for students. Uh, that's, that's it exists during the school, I guess, during uh, the school week when we're in the building. And so we've set an expectation for that to happen virtually. Uh, so here's what the teacher emailed. You know, I haven't set up my video office hours. I just got my camera yesterday, I'm working on it. And I told students to just keep emailing me. And so the response back was essentially, you know, reiterating what we had asked teachers to do, which is highlighted there on the right, is that just during these office hours, teachers need to at minimum be available via either Google Hangout or an online chat forum. So we're not trying to set a really uh, high bar that teachers may not be comfortable with. We're just saying, hey, whatever works for you and you're comfortable with, um, you can use. And so if it's just a live chat or you're just saying, I'm in front of my computer and I can answer your emails in real time, that, that is okay, and that's just a way we're trying to ease our teachers into these platforms. We know our teachers need uh, to be reminded of that and, that and have that reinforced. And that part of the um, note on the right that's in bold underlined was actually part of an all staff email. And so we just took the existing communication and sent it back to the teacher as a reminder. Um, and our hope is again that, that, all, that those all staff communications are kind of our anchor where we can just you know, recap things with parents, with kids, and with, with staff uh, based on what was in the all staff communication. Uh, and then avoid the lowest common denominator. This is a tough one. Uh, we know that some districts and some schools we've talked to or looked at kind of get frozen when they think about, well, how will I serve students in certain situations? You know, whether it be a home situation, whether it be special education, whether it be certain services that are really, really hard and really, really difficult to do in a virtual space. And we know they're already difficult to do in, in a physical building when you're with the kid um, or with the student. And there's lots of economic challenges. There's lots of access challenges. Um, but what we're trying to think about here at Clayton Valley, and this is our philosophy, and it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, mean that does not mean it needs to be your philosophy. But what we're thinking about is um, what's the highest expectation we can set for kids. And then on the back end, you know, all of our staff are getting paid, all of our staff are getting benefits. That is a huge luxury for the education industry to have during this time. We have enough staff and we have enough intelligence and capacity to figure out how to problem solve for the outliers or the folks who are going to struggle with these expectations. Uh, and so we're not, uh, we don't want to set the bar low just because certain students are going to have a hard time accessing it. Um, we want to set the bar high and then problem solve for how to get students to meet those expectations. And like I said here, you know, when you wrote your charter petition uh, and you set goals within your charter petition or in your LCAP, you know, you didn't set them at what the, uh, the lowest bar was. You set them high and then, you know, you need to figure out how to get kids to reach that. And then today's circumstances are essentially the same. Uh, so set a high bar for kids. They can meet it. Uh, they may need more resources, they may need more support, and that may look different than what it looks like in, in the physical building. But, um, you know, that's a good problem to have versus the one that I've seen in a couple places where everything is paused, everything is frozen because they haven't been able to problem solve for a certain uh, thing, whether it's, again, internet access or special education of the two I've seen are the biggest uh, roadblocks for folks. 
and then get easy customer service wins. Um, everyone's in a stressful time. You have parents who have turned into teachers. You have families who now spend all day in the same house or on the same plot of land or the same apartment. Um, so it's stressful enough for them without the school uh, work and, this, and the school challenges. And so I would just say, anytime you can take that stress off, anytime you can relieve it and just, again, be that constant, be that customer service, um, that pleasant experience that they could have, I would do that. And so if you can do food service, I would. Um, I'm not sure, again, what everyone's individual capacity is, but that's been a huge relief for our folks. Um, and it's been a big win for our community as well, because we're a high school. Um, in the district that we're physically located in, there is no food service from the district in our area. So essentially all of the K-12 kids are coming to us um, if they need food and if they want it. Uh, if you can do device distribution, um, I would strongly suggest it. I know people are concerned about assets and resources, but this is a time to try to get more, more things in kids' hands and more opportunities. I would also consider allowing your, your teachers to check out some devices, um, especially if you have Google Chromebooks for kids that are not being used by kids because not everyone checked them out. But remember that your teachers are at home and if they have kids, their kids are at home too and they all need a device most likely to do some kind of work or get engaged. And so having your teachers be able to check out a device so they can keep their kid engaged while the teacher also has access to their school laptop or school device has really been a good win for some of our teachers who have families and kids at home. Uh, and if you don't have devices to give out or if you're not using the internet, I would just recommend, you know, checking out those textbooks in the same way you check out a Chromebook, getting those resources in the hands of kids. Uh, and if you've got a photocopy textbooks or student materials, um, again, let's make kids' lives as easy as possible and give them the resources and err on the side of giving out more things in this time as opposed to being concerned about that um, asset at your school site. And then just a quick response to families. Uh, we, because we have food services, our school office is open each day for five hours. We have a rotation of two admin and one classified uh, manager who's in place to uh, be there to be a, just a support to folks. We know kids might need something from their locker. Teachers might need to come in and get something from their classroom, especially when we said, hey, instead of April 14th, we're going to be closed through May 1st. A lot of folks want to come in and get that extra computer screen or whatever it is. And so making sure that they have access to that and that's not a pressure point on them has been helpful for us. Um, also, we have some kids who need to come in and pick up work because uh, the way that their accommodations work is that they you know, get some differentiation with their materials and so making sure our office is open um, so they can do that has been a big win for us. And then not everyone's coming in physically, so I just think that the 24-hour response time via email is huge, whether that's, uh, again, families or um, internal communication among staff or whoever else it may be. And then the last one was just sprinkle in the joy. Um, I do want to get to some questions, but again, I want to remind folks we have we have humans who are our staff members, we have humans who are our students and, and families, and so it's important to recognize that aspect of them and that part of them. Um, there's a couple things on this next slide. Uh, our kids, uh, before we left, they actually entered a cartoon contest with the New York Times, and we had five kids, I think, get an honorable mention or a second place runner up. And so just making sure that when that happens, you're not just, you know, celebrating those kids, which is important, but you're sharing that out so that folks kind of get a little bit of touch and, and, and contact with what's going on uh, beyond the four walls of, again, their apartment or their house or wherever they're staying right now. And then again, like I said, there's, there's awesome stuff happening in your community each day. Uh, find a way, if you can, to recognize and celebrate it. You know, on here I have just a couple of examples of giving away laptops to kids, um, the food service we've done, and then uh, we did, we, we have disaster kits all over campus. We were able to find 1,100 of the N95 masks and all of our science teachers stepped up and donated their goggles. And so we were able to donate all those things to our local hospital because we know that uh, they need it more than we do in this time. Uh, the other thing that we did that's kind of fun, again, to keep the joy going is we have a home classroom contest. Uh, and there's a staff version of it. There's a student version of it. And so you can see here, this is the staff version of it. Uh, the options are, you know, you can have a meal delivered to your house, you can get some swag from us if you win, or, uh, you know, we thought it would be kind of fun. If you need toilet paper, we can, we can bring some toilet paper to you. All of you are sitting on mounds of toilet paper at your school, they're not being used. And so that was just a way to inject a little bit of joy and humor into the week last week as folks were kind of getting settled in and the stress started to hit around Thursday of the first week that they were stuck at home. Um, and then again, we have a student version here 
Uh, students were able to share their photos, they could share their routine, they could send us a video of their routine, parents could share the routine that they had for their kids as a way to try to share that with um, other families as well because we're all, we're all going through this and the only way we can get through it uh, is together. And so we're hoping that we can share some of these best practices as well. And again, this is an example of um, sprinkling some of that joy into people's weeks. So um, that's it. I do have, the only appendix slide I had was just, this is like the tracker that uh, our staff, our administrators use to keep track of our teachers, you know, posting the right thing within Schoology. This is not meant to be uh, an oversight or a value tool. It's actually meant to be a productive kind of coaching tool. And what we're trying to do is through our department meetings is set up, you know, where all the ninth grade English teachers can look and see what everyone else is posting. Uh, or all the algebra one teachers can look and see what everyone else is posting. Because at the end of the day, if you have multiple teachers teaching the same subject and they're doing it virtually, let's get them as aligned as possible so that they're spending as much time on uh, kids and supporting our kids as opposed to on material creation. Uh, so again, if you've got you know three or four algebra one teachers in your school, which depends on the size of your school, if they can all post the same thing for the week and then spend their time supporting kids, that's a much better option than all four of them coming up with their own algebra one activities and spending time and energy on that. So I think that closes out our time. I'm gonna turn it back over, I think, to Jennifer, who is gonna then facilitate the next part of this. So I appreciate you and I hope that that was not too long because I think that your questions are what's gonna really drive this conversation. And again, I want us to all be able to collaborate and learn and steal from each other. And I look forward to stealing from you all. So Jennifer, I think that was it for that part. Um, I wanna dive into some details on, on, on folks' questions and discussions. So I think that would be a great next step. So I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. Great, thanks, Jim. So we've had a few questions come in. The first is from Veronica. She asked, um, she asked if your school is still presenting new material to your students. And Veronica, she also asked, um, so let's start there, but I'm gonna unmute you, Veronica, because you had another question as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Veronica, for the question. Um, and maybe when you, when you get a chance to follow up to my response, you can um, share your school and where you're from. But uh, in terms of your question about new material, yes. So we are presenting new material. And so um, if we have a kid in Algebra 1, they need to be in geometry next year. And that geometry class may not recognize the fact that they had to pause their Algebra 1 class. And so we are trying to get through um, as much as we can. We do want to make sure our expectations are uh, balanced against reality. And so we're trying to think of how to best do that. I think an example of that is the, uh, the AP exams that are coming up. We have, I believe, 12 or 1300 AP exams that kids have registered for. Obviously there's kids who register for multiple exams, but I think we have seven or 800 kids in our school who are gonna take an AP exam. And we did see that AP made an adjustment to make those exams shorter uh, and make them only go through what, what's covered in March, which is great. Um, however, we also know that our kids, you know, again, if they're going to college or going to the next class, they need the foundational skills. So we're moving forward. And one thing we're trying to do to address that is, is give them more time. So for example, uh, next week is the last week before our spring break. We have spring break April 6th through 10th. Uh, I have to imagine that most people's spring breaks are fairly clear and open right now. And so we're allowing kids to the, to the best extent possible to use spring break as, as for lack of a better word, a catch up week. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need our teachers working over that time, but kids will, when they walk into spring break on next Friday, April 3rd, have a post from each teacher on what makeup work can look like and how kids can get that done. Um, and that way we're taking the week of spring break and kind of adding it to these first three weeks of distance learning so that kids have four weeks to do the first three weeks of work for distance learning and hopefully that'll help them catch up. Uh, so Veronica, I would love any follow-up, but maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, what your position is, and then we can jump into any other questions you've got. Yeah, um, I'm a sixth grade teacher in California, um, in, in Hammett, California. Great. And I teach at a charter. Most of my kids, most of my class is self-contained, except for uh, PE and art. Okay. And um, basically for our, I'm not sure if, um, I, I'm sorry, I know you may have mentioned what state you guys were in. I'm not we're, sure. We're, we're all in California. This is, this is this, yeah, this is being put on by the California Charter Schools Association. So I believe everyone's in California. Okay, great. Um, we were basically told this week that we needed to put 
new instruction on hold because we weren't sure what the bylaws were for SPED. So that's why I was presenting new material and I you know, felt confident in what I was doing for my students. And my students were saying the same thing, that they love what I was doing, that they felt guided, they didn't, you know, that kind of thing. But basically we were told that because SPED services couldn't keep going ideally the way they wanted it to be done, that because of that GE had to stop and basically put, be put on pause. So I was just wondering how, that was my question after that, was what is your SPED department doing to try to service your students on an IEP or is that on hold? And is that acceptable yeah. by the state? Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. so good question. So, so one, I think that kind of goes with the theme of, you know, the two themes, one was like, don't play to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and two is, you know, don't let perfection get in the way of progress. So um, we are moving forward. I have not seen, and we have a, a director who's over special education. I have not seen anything that says, you know, uh, the, the expectations for special education have changed in terms of allowing them to access the curriculum. Um, but I have seen a lot of folks say, hey, like two things. One, like we're going to be flexible and understand that you're in a much different environment in terms of how you provide those services. And two, um, I've heard, I've seen repeatedly folks say from the state and federal level, don't stop instruction for all kids just because you're having a, you know, you need a, a little bit more time to figure out special education. Um, so we're moving forward. We do have, again, with a school of 2,250 kids, we have quite a big team. And so we have our case managers who all have a set of students that they're working with. And each case manager has assigned to them, not necessarily a full, but at least part of a paraprofessional or special education assistant. Um, and they are working with their caseloads. They have a pretty complex kind of Google Doc um, checklist system that they've set up to make sure that they're both communicating, which goes back to that theme of communication, but communicating with families and with kids, making sure that they're getting what they need, and then being able and ready to provide support uh, for those families. And so we do have kids who have a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional during the school day when they're physically in the building. And so we have those students have access to their paraprofessional for multiple hours, if not the full day, depending on their IEP. And that's virtual, so it's via Google Hangout or via FaceTime or via Zoom or whatever it is that they've worked out, but that support is still there. And that we were not perfect at that, and that took us a little bit, a little while to figure out, you know, we didn't have it down the first week, but we've got it down the second week. And as long as we communicate proactively with our parents, they were understanding and knowing that the support was coming. Uh, we have families who do come and pick up work because that, you know, they get it modified or they get an accommodation. Um, and that's fine too, and we've been able to provide that. So I would just encourage you, um, and again, if you're in a school district, it's a little bit harder, but if you're in a standalone charter school, I would encourage folks to move forward with their instruction for kids. Um, and again, figure out the outliers, figure out those challenges while you're holding high expectations for everybody else. And it sounds, Veronica, like your kids are in sixth grade. Um, they're gonna be in seventh grade next year. They need all the skills that they can get going into seventh grade. Uh, I want to emphasize that's our philosophy at Clayton Valley. Um, it doesn't mean it's the right one. It doesn't mean it has to be your philosophy, but I'm just sharing what we're doing here. And I think, um, you know, you've got a lot of folks on the phone who maybe can help. So Jennifer, I'm, maybe there's more questions. I'm not sure how many there are. I can't see them. Yep. We've had a good number of questions come in. So let's go to Sarah. Sarah asked in the chat, how are you sharing photos with all of your students? And Sarah, I will unmute you. Uh, so we have, uh, so all of our students have a school email and we put together a newsletter uh, in the MailChimp format. And so that just gets shared uh, that way. We also know that kids have plenty of different social media um, platforms, I guess, or whatever their social media options. And so we have an associated student body. We have student government. They have their own kind of Twitter and Instagram and other feeds. And so we're trying to work with them to share those things in that way as well. So um, again, it's just that idea of like, you know, there's great things going on with your kids. There's great things going on with your family that families that may or may not be school related. The same thing with your staff, uh, just kind of sharing that, you know, this is what folks are doing and their lives are going on. We're all human and let's make sure we recognize that side of them. So hopefully that helps. Um, but uh, yeah, the school wide emails really help uh, whether it's through the parent newsletter or through the student emails. Great. Thanks. Um, so the next question is from Victor. Victor asked, how are you dealing with assessments and the integrity of doing them online? Yeah, so that's not something that we've figured out perfectly. Um, 
A couple of things, one in our Schoology platform, it does allow for the assessment to be timed. Uh, we did say that, you know, we want to have a common um, deadline for all assignments of like 11.59 p.m. because who knows what a kid's access to computers in the home situation is like. However, within our Schoology platform, a teacher can say, you get 10 or 15 minutes for this assessment. Um, and so that is something that, you know, they don't have the unlimited time to go and search for the answers on the internet or whatever it is. So that assessment has a clock on it, which is very nice. Um, that doesn't really uh, accommodate for the fact that one kid could take that assessment early, get all the answers, and then, um, you know, give it to their friends. We can see how long it takes for a kid to do an assessment. So if it takes the first kids 30 minutes to do it and it takes the second group of kids two minutes to do it, we, uh, we, we flag that. And I don't know that we figured out the answer, but we at least have the data to flag. Um, the second thing we've been talking to teachers about is making the assessments more rigorous. So uh, if you have a multiple choice um, question that obviously has one right answer that would be easy to replicate, maybe you make it so that the kids have to explain why three answers are incorrect and the other answer is correct. Or you could give them a sample multiple choice question and make them come up with the answers and make them explain why uh, you know, three answers are incorrect and why the one answer is, is correct. So you can make it a little bit more rigorous on some of the ones that are that are a little bit easier to, uh, to, to get the answers from your teammates if you want. The other, the other thing that we thought about was uh, with our tools is just kind of a test scrambler. So scrambling the order of the questions, scrambling the order of the multiple choice answers. So that way um, it gives a little bit more integrity to the assessment. Uh, again, it's nothing perfect that we figured out, but if you're doing some level of performance-based assessment, it's much harder for the kid to kind of fib that. Um, and we use tools like turnitin.com to make sure that kids aren't plagiarizing and doing those types of things. So hopefully that helps. But Victor, I'm not sure if you're unmuted or not, but if you had a follow-up, um, happy to take that one too. Um, when I'm you got me thinking in regards to due dates we have some students that have to go to you know they go to work with their parents all day and can't get back until night and it's just an undue stress to have a, a a really hard due date for everybody are you guys flexible do you guys give grace when parents reach out to you in certain situations yeah well so one was that's why we put the 11:59 p.m deadline on there for the day it was due the second part of that was that we are going to say uh for the things that have been assigned um, during this time, during these three weeks, when we go on spring break, like that's your time to get it done. So essentially you're getting a full week uh, of kind of makeup time if you want to get the first three weeks of work done. And so we hope that that takes into account and recognizes some of the challenges that some of our families and some of our kids have with just, just time to actually do schoolwork. Uh, Cause that is a real thing for many kids. And what we've emphasized with our teachers is if it's something that you've been doing all year on Google Classroom and your kids have been turning stuff in, you know, your, your existing policies and late policies will probably work. Uh, but if it's something new that you're asking kids to do because it's in a virtual environment, then you need to be flexible and liberal with your policies and recognize that, you know, they all have challenges. And I have not had any experience where a teacher or a staff member or a parent has complained that they reached out with an individual circumstance and the teacher said no and was just kind of really rigid with it. So. Um, I haven't heard of that, but uh, I'll, you know, with the number of teachers and kids we have, it's possible it's going on. We're not encouraging it. We're, we are encouraging a level of empathy and, and humility and understanding where, you know, where situation that some of our kids are in. So hopefully that helps. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to let you keep quarterbacking this. I know this is a nine to 10 uh, time slot for folks. So we've got about 20 minutes left. Yep. And um, keep the questions coming. And if not, uh, we will end early, but we do have another question, which is how are you grading students during this time? Yeah, so just like the first question from Veronica, uh, this question is kind of like, we, we have the same process and policies. So our, our expectation with all of our teachers is that grades are updated weekly. We do check that. Uh, we have, uh, so we use Schoology kind of for the online learning management system and we have PowerSchool for the student information system. The two systems actually link and PowerSchool recently bought Schoology, so like, there's some cool features when you grade in Schoology, it automatically feeds into PowerSchool. But essentially, we're just, we're, we maintain the same grading expectations for our teachers. Um, in terms of how they're grading individual assignments, that is, depends on the assignment. But we are, making, we are wanting and, and hoping that folks are using more rubrics and more uh, kind of standardized tools so that it's very clear for a kid what to submit and what to turn in. 
The other thing is we're, we're making sure our teachers don't feel like they have to grade everything. Uh, that's unsustainable and unreasonable. Um, and that's not just the case when you're in a virtual world, but it's also the case when you're in the, in the physical classroom. Um, but just making sure that our teachers know that as well. And you know, if they have a simple assignment like a journal entry or something, they can grade it uh, in a simple way. You know, did, you, did the kid turn it on time? Is it complete? You know, that, that saves a lot of time and makes it efficient. But um, we are trying as best as possible to maintain the same set of expectations that we had during the school year um, with our kids now. And again, uh, we wanna recognize that they're going somewhere after this school year, whether it's to the next grade or to college, and we have to make sure we're getting them ready for that. So uh, Jennifer, I'm not sure who that question was from, but if they've got a follow-up, um, I'd love to dive into that. Cause I think that this is a, some of these questions are really difficult conversations that um, you've got to make as a school. And you know, the more information we can share about what, what everyone's doing, I think the better, so. Yep, that question came from Bridget. Um, Bridget, did you have any follow-up? No, thank you very much for that clarification. That was really helpful. No problem. Great. Thank Thanks you for so joining much. us. And I feel like this is a good point for us to plug the fact that we wanna, after this, have a series of webinars on these specific topics like grading. Um, so keep a lookout for those from CCSA. And then the next question is from Raul. He asked, how prepared is your organization to issue high school credits if this distance learning platform extends past May? Uh, thank you, Raul. Yeah, so we are uh, planning on our kids uh, earning the credit for the classes that they're in and graduating. Um, we do have some expectations that they need to meet. And our, uh, so, so we're not changing, I guess, our expectation around um, credits and the fact that we're going to be awarding credits for our kids in their class for uh, you know continuing to do the work that we're asking them to do in these circumstances because it's it's not their fault um, what we're trying to figure out and uh, this is this is kind of the messaging part that we, we haven't shared with kids and families and not not really with all of our staff either is uh, how does that more time factor play in so um, we don't we want kids to have a sense of urgency. We want families and, and staff to have a sense of urgency. We want them to get their work done now because they're they're sitting at home and they have the capacity to do it. Um, how we also recognize that there are a lot of challenges with folks classrooms and with their access to work right now, whether you're a kid or a teacher. And so one thing that we're trying again with the spring break week is like to say, hey, we're giving an extra week. So kids essentially have three weeks of work for distance learning and they're going to have four weeks to do it. Let's look and see how that went, and is that something that could apply to the summer as well? Uh, so we're not saying that you know after June 5th you're getting any new work, but if there's stuff you haven't completed, you have you know an extension into the summer for X amount of days to get that done so you can earn that credit because we can't have kids on one end not doing anything and earning the same credit as the kid who did all the work. Uh, on the other end, it's very hard to hold a kid to the exact same expectations we'd hold them to in the physical classroom um, if they have legitimate circumstances. And that's the part about kind of making sure we're not playing to the lowest common denominator and we're holding high expectations while trying to figure out for the outliers, how do we support them and make them successful? Um, but we do plan on having seniors graduate and you know, maybe we have to run two graduations. We, we want we run one in um, June like normal for our kids who are on track and we say hey to our kids who just kind of checked out for a couple months while they were trying to learn online and didn't really do what they needed to do maybe you're going to graduate in July or August and here's the things you need to do um, we do run a full summer school program and we do have full staff for summer school not all of our staff but a full program and so I feel like that's a that's a problem that we can solve uh, when we get there um, and we'll have a plan for it going into it but um, yeah, we're going to offer full credit. So Raul, if there's follow-ups there, if you're unmuted, uh, would love to hear them. Because I think, again, for especially for high schools where kids are going to college or kids may be transferring or kids need to go to the next class and next grade and earn credits for graduation, this is a good question. So happy to hear more, Raul. If you can share where you're from and what school you're at, that would be great. Hi, and then Raul, if you don't have any. Yeah, oh, sorry. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, we're in Los Angeles. We're a charter organization that has the K through 12. But our, 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 what we're struggling to come up with this is uh, what the if the CSU and the UC systems have said anything about this new modality 
when it comes to actually issuing credits at the end of the year and getting their and getting all the transcripts ready to be mailed to the universities. Uh, and uh, obviously with the question of rigor, I don't know what the, if there's any conversations that the colleges are having about this new modality for the high school kids. Yeah, well, I think one is, you know, err on the side of, let's just assume that, you know, that they, that they maintain the same expectation that they have now. That's why you want to maintain as high of an expectation as possible for the kids. I think two, regardless of what they accept at the high school level, the, the same level of rigor is going to exist in those institutions when your kids show up that, that exists now. So let's make sure we're there as prepared as possible for getting there. I think the third one is just recognizing that there's, there's likely going to be a generosity of spirit from the whole industry because we've just watched all the colleges in the state and probably across the country move to online classes. And so they're doing that themselves. They, there, there's no reason to assume that they wouldn't realize that the high schools where their you know, future students are, are facing the same circumstances and having to deal with it. But again, when your kids who are seniors or juniors or whatever, when they're in their second, third year of college, the rigor level that is, is expected of them is going to be the same, uh, whether they have this COVID-19 closure or not. So let's make sure we're doing everything we can to get them ready for that environment to be successful. That would be our philosophy. Um, it doesn't have to be everybody's philosophy, but that would be my answer. Um, because that's, you know, part of the promise that we've made the kids and part of the commitment we made uh, when, we went, when we became a charter school. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. We just had a new question come in from Jorge. He asked, I know you mentioned that we should not let the lowest common denominator get in the way of our implementation. However, how are your teachers tackling students that do not have internet access or are not completing the assigned work? Yeah, so um, what, we, what we try to, and so as a high school, you know, kids have five or six teachers, depending on their grade level. Um, most of them have six. And so uh, if a kid is struggling in a single class, we are asking the teacher to make sure that they're following up. If the kid is struggling across classes, that is not a teacher solution because that is not essentially going to be something the teacher has the capacity for. And so we're taking that on at the school level. And so we are tracking through our online system, uh, kids engagement. There's a set of analytics that we can run through Schoology um, to just check on kids' actual engagement online. And then we have a team on the back end, which includes our guidance counselors uh, who are targeting our kids who are struggling with that. Um, we do have a very small group of students. It's about, it's less than 90, so less than 4% of our kids who are showing through just the data online that they're not accessing Schoology at the same level as other folks. Um, and so that's why we have that Thursday meeting of our admin team where we're focusing just on kids and supporting kids. And behind that is another layer of folks who actually have a spreadsheet with every single kid on it who's in that, who's kind of on the struggle bus for lack of a better word. And we're trying to pinpoint what are their issues. So if you're a kid who legitimately does not have any internet access at home, uh, the two things we're trying to do is you know, beyond reaching out to that family and figuring out that that's the issue is teach them how to turn their phones into a Wi-Fi hotspot as well as provide them a Wi-Fi hotspot through something like, you know, uh, one of the companies that, that sells them. Uh, those tend to be on back order these days, just like some other uh, important materials. And so um, we're waiting for that. But while we're doing that, we're also trying to feed them all of the information about how to get free Internet uh, here in the Bay Area, Comcast is offering a couple months of free internet access. Um, and so we're just trying, you know, between those resources, I think we've been pretty successful about making sure all of our kids have internet access. You know, uh, the hotspot we can provide them at home, um, in addition to the fact that we can give them a device if they need it. Uh, the turn your phone into a hotspot kind of tutorial or how to, which is through our IT team, and then the um, you know, go to go to a provider, a cable internet provider, and take advantage of the fact that they're offering free Wi-Fi. Um, so those would be the things I would I would try to push. Again, it's not a, it's not uh, going to solve all of it. Um, and worst comes to worst, you print out the materials for the kid and give them a hard copy of what's going on. So um, I think that was Jorge. So I don't know Jorge if you have a follow up to that. Uh, no, thank you. That actually answered my question. I think once we get all in the same page, is going to tackle that issue that we're having at our school too. Yeah, and I would I would recommend making sure you have some way of tracking kids on an individual basis 
uh, who are in that boat of struggling, whether it's academics or social emotional or something like internet access, just so you're looking at a kid by kid level and then having time set aside in your schedule, uh, at least for the administrative team on, this, on, the, on campus to talk about kids at the kid level. Because when you talk about a kid and you come up with a solution for that kid, any other kid who falls in that same bucket, you already have the solution for them. Uh, and you can just replicate it. So hopefully that's helpful. Again, our, our system is not perfect. We're trying to make it better every day. Um, and you know, listening to other people and stealing from other people has, has been a great resource for us. And so I hope that you're able to do that uh, both through this call and through other folks within your community. Great, thanks. Um, this can be the last question. Debbie uh, asked if you could just go back to that last slide with the chart and explain that again for folks who missed that. Yeah, hi Debbie, thank you for the question. So I'm gonna actually pause at a different slide. Um, so you can see this one on the, uh, this slide that's on the screen, hopefully, it says distance learning and then expectations. So these are the expectations that we sent out for teachers. Um, and this is what we wanted them to post in Schoology every day. So we know that some of our teachers prefer Google Classroom, some use Schoology, some use, you know, other cool things that I haven't heard of or don't know about. However, if a kid's got six teachers, the kid needs one anchor to know where everything is located. And we've decided that we're using Schoology for that. And it, it took us a week to do that. Um, and we, we do have collective bargaining agreements here at Clayton Valley. So we had to negotiate with the California Teachers Association or CTA on the Saturday after we closed back on March 14th for what the expectations would be. Uh, and we did put in our MOU that everything would be posted on Schoology. And then this slide that you're looking at now is kind of a uh, more granular version of what that post needs to look like. So then the last slide that was all the way in the appendix um, is essentially the tracker that we set up on the back end for our admin. And our admin essentially go into Schoology in the morning after 8.30 and go through this and see, you know, they list the teacher name and the course that's already preloaded in there, but then they see on Monday, did the person do their daily update, yes or no? Was it on time, meaning was it by 8.30, yes or no? Is the work due at the correct time, uh, which is 11.59 p.m.? Is the uh, activities that the teacher has laid out for the kid approximately one hour of work for your average student? That's a difficult, you know, that's a difficult estimate, but if the teacher says, hey, read for 15 minutes, then you know they didn't meet the hour of work. Uh, likewise, if the teacher is giving them a ton of things to do, then they're over it and we need to make sure we're flagging that as well. I mean, we get the same number of complaints that my kid has too much work as we get that my kid doesn't have any work to do. So we just kind of ballparked it at one hour a day per class is what we're looking for, which for most kids, again, is six hours a day. Um, for the assignment, what we're actually doing is we're actually trying to figure out like what is the assignment that kids are being asked to do. So we're just copying and pasting the assignment in there. Uh, is it calendared in Schoology? That's just a simple yes or no. Is the assignment not only in the post, but is also in the calendar so that when a kid looks at their calendar, they can see all the assignments for all six of their classes and when they're due. And then measurable, measurable product means, um, are you asking the kid to submit or turn something in? Okay. And so you may ask for four or five activities, you know, read for 15 minutes, write a reflection, draft your essay, uh, and then submit your response to the chapter analysis questions. And so what the measurable product is, is like that submit your response to the chapter analysis questions while the other activities may not have a measurable product. We want kids to have something that they're held accountable to submitting. And it doesn't have to be every day, uh, but it has to be something that they're actually turning in versus the teacher just hoping through best intentions that the kid does what they're asked to do. So, it's, so again, this is our, our tool to kind of measure that. What we wanted to use this as is a reflection back to the department, a reflection back to the content team, like the, the people who teach Algebra 1 or English 9, and say, hey, here's what you all are asking kids to do. How can we align? How can we make this better? How can we use this information to improve? So it's meant to be a coaching tool and a support versus you know, some kind of I gotcha as an administrator. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with 90 teachers and the number of classes we offer, it's very hard to just click through Schoology and see this. So we wanted to pull this in um, and essentially what we tell administrators is this is your walkthrough for the day. You might be used to physically walking through a classroom and just seeing some basic conditions for learning in place. Uh, this, is, this is how we're walking through right now. 
Um, and this is not perfect because it takes some time to figure out what are teachers asking kids to do, especially if they don't follow our format. But that's where that coaching conversation comes in to tell the teacher what's going on. So, Debbie, I hope that answered your question. Um, I'm not sure if you're unmuted, if you have a follow-up. No, no, I am unmuted. I, I, my one, um, the one thing that we found is the expectation of hour, you know, an hour a day. Um, we just found that, you know, for a regular high school class, that's legitimate. But in the situation where you may have four kids at home or three kids at home with two computers, you know, measuring that, that the, the hour a day a lot of times isn't realistic without putting a whole lot of pressure on. And so um, give, the kind of, kid, give the kids some devices so that they don't have that ratio problem at home. Well, that we're doing that, but it's just the, the fact of, you know, a parent trying to monitor it all. We just feel like some of that is really uh, putting a whole lot of pressure. So we've been just playing with, you know, what's realistic expectation. So um, it's, I mean, it's kind of good to see how you're laying it all out here for, for this, for it. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, um, that, that's a real thing, right? You've got parents whose first concern is not their kid's education. Their first concern is, is staying employed and having enough money to put food on the table and pay the bills. Exactly. Um, we have high school kids, so they're a little bit more independent. Um, we want them to be able to rely on each other and to have, you know, those kind of groups. We want parents to be able to have some kind of group think to, to be able to find out some best practices. But um, that's, that's also why we kind of put that more time intervention in place. If you, I don't know if you want to call it intervention or not, but that more time support option in place of, hey, you couldn't get this work done in three weeks. Okay, take the spring break week as a fourth week and try to catch up and get, get done what you can get done. Because it's very likely if you had something planned for spring break, it's not happening. Uh, and so kids are going to need something to do over spring break. Um, and that's why we're trying to, to make that as one of our supports as an option for kids. So again, not perfect, but I'd rather problem solve for the kid who needs some support or the parent who needs some support with kind of executive function and time management at home than, you know, say, okay, well, because this 5% or 10% of our population has this struggle, we're not going to move forward with these expectations for everybody. And that's, that's a tension that you've got to figure out for your school. And everyone has a different ratio in terms of kids in, in the, uh, in, in where they're at in terms of their situations. So, um, but we're, we're, you know, operating with the mindset that uh, our kids can all do this and if held to high expectations and given support, they can reach that bar. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, we got to 959, Jennifer. I'm not sure yeah. if that was uh, on purpose or this not. This is but. perfect. Um, well, thank you all for the great questions and huge thanks to Jim. We asked him to do this on Wednesday and he was able to throw together this really helpful presentation. Uh, and then I just want to mention one more time that based on member surveys and member engagement, we have heard that issues like community engagement, supporting special education needs, creating online infrastructure, grading student work, and teacher PD are some issues that are coming up most frequently for leaders. So I want you all, uh, I hope that you all look out for more info from CCSA about upcoming webinars that deep dive on these smaller topics. And then we want to thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. When you exit the webinar, you'll be auto-directed to a very short survey, just two questions, and we would really appreciate the feedback if you have just a minute to let us know how this went. And as many of you have asked, we will share out the materials and we have recorded this session if you missed anything. So hope you have a great day and hope you all are safe and healthy.